we are back on the Zero Hour. As always, I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. And as always, I look forward to speaking with my next guest, Richard Wolf. Uh, as you know, if you're a regular viewer of this or his or many other programs, is an economist and economic historian, the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV. Uh, he is a professor and professor emeritus. We we needn't, I suppose, go through the entire uh, list now. His latest book is The Sickness is the System about the COVID epidemic and um, and its broader implications. And without any further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, RJ. Glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, the topic du jour or uh, of the month or what have you is artificial intelligence. I know you've made uh, so-called. I have my issues with the term, but um, you've talked a little bit about that recently on your own channel uh, and through your own outlets. I've talked about it somewhat, actually for quite a while now. And um, obviously there are multiple dimensions to the implications of uh, AI or artificial intelligence for working people, for society as a whole. But I'm I mean, just starting at the broadest level. It's a big deal now because of the new technologies that are being released and because of a sudden seeming surge in uh, progress and the sophistication of the technology. What's your take on all of this? Well, I'm glad you asked. You're right. It's a hot topic. You're right that people are uh, concerned about it. Um, I'm going to respond to your question, as I have to others that ask me about it, in the following way. First, a general point. The human race has come up with technological changes periodically for thousands of years. Some have been cataclysmic in terms of what they've changed. Uh, you know, discover how to navigate oceans and you can suddenly move around the world in a way that for generations before had been not possible. Electricity, chemistry, atomic energy, and we can go through them. They're well known. Uh, the very development of what we modern take it for granted, machinery, and when it begins with the loom to make textiles and all of the rest. In every one of those cases, Either there was a tremendous hoopla about the negative possibilities, or if there wasn't a tremendous hoopla, slowly but over time, an anxiety developed that there would be, from the technology, winners and losers. That the early euphoria that often attended these breakthroughs that it would be a wonderful thing for everybody, was almost in every case disappointed later on. It turned out to be wonderful for some people, but it turned out to be awful for others. You know, liberation of the human being from the drudgery of agricultural labor was thought to liberate us from all that drudgery. We would move into cities and we would work with the aid of machines, et cetera, et cetera. Well, our urban ghettos are every bit as bad in their own way as the agricultural conditions uh, that people had suffered before. Why am I saying this? Artificial intelligence is another breakthrough. I don't mean to diminish it, but I don't want to hype it either. And I suspect that it will be implemented, introduced into our daily lives, the way chemistry or atomic energy or the railroad or all the other big breakthroughs were. It'll take some time and it will be integrated into our lives so that we come to take it for granted. And we will look back, as we look back now on the railroads or the power loom or, you know, the ocean travel, kind of wistfully barely remembering why there was such a hoopla because it has become part of our life. I expect exactly the same thing with artificial intelligence. In other words, it will change lots of 
habits we have, lots of processes we now take for granted will be adjusted, some more, some less. But I do not think that the key issue about technology is peculiar to AI. It wasn't. It is, in fact, the same issue that confronted many earlier technical breakthroughs. And it's on that issue that I'd like to say a few words. Okay. Okay, here we go. Technology can go in many directions. I'm going to use the simplest example I know of, but it applies to AI as it does to many other things. Imagine with me a technical breakthrough that makes workers in some or all industries, it doesn't matter, twice as productive as they were before. Or if you like the, the way to say this, another way to say this is you need half as many workers to get the same amount of work done because this new technology enables this increase in labor productivity. Okay, let's imagine AI does that and that there are loads of employers who are going to be making the decision in the months and years ahead, do I bring artificial intelligence into my business, my factory, my office, my store, or do I not? And if I do, how do I do it? Now, here comes the key point. If you have a capitalist system, which we do, and the people who decide when and how quickly and where to install a new technology are the employer class, then the first thing to be honest about is we're allowing the employers who in this country at the most extreme in their favor counting are less than 3% of our population to actually be in the position to decide whether or not to use AI, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. We are allowing that decision to be made and to have they have veto power over whether or not to do it. That's the first thing. We don't handle technology democratically, and we never did. Now comes the second problem. The capitalist will tell you, if you speak to him or her, that they're in business to make money, or to use the economics, they're profit maximizers. So if they see a new AI invention the new chat AI and all of that, if they see that, they're going to say, wow, how would this affect my profits? If they're in a rush to introduce it, it's because they have determined that introducing that technology will be boosting their profits. If they say no or they're slow, that's because they think it will be less helpful to their profits. There's no mystery here. And if you go to business school, they teach you to do this exactly the way I said it. All right, now let's see. I know how a profit-driven capitalist will do this. He will bring in the technology and he will fire half his workers. Why? Because he doesn't need them. He may decide to in increase his business, but that's a decision he could have made before. And that's a decision he could make later. That's a separate decision from how am I going to introduce this technology? And he's going to bring it in the way he brought it in every other breakthrough I've mentioned on this program right now. He's going to fire half the workers. Why? Because he can. He's allowed to do that. And that will enhance his profits because just stay with me on the simple logic of it. The same amount of stuff will be produced with half the workers. He can sell it at the same price, therefore bringing in the same revenue as before. And the only difference then becomes he will not make the profit he used to make when he had twice the payroll for workers because half of that payroll he doesn't have to pay meet. So he can take the revenue and what the half of it that he would have given to his workers, he keeps now for himself. It becomes part of profits. There is no responsibility in capitalism that that capitalist has to the workers displaced by the new technology. They're on their own. Maybe they'll find a good job. 
Maybe they'll become a greeter at Walmart. Maybe they'll have a heart attack and die. We don't know, and it is not the responsibility of the capitalist. So, in fact, that's how the technology will be used. And if you understand that historically, you'll understand why many working people, many labor unions, are very suspicious and very skeptical about technological progress, not because they don't see what's, what it can do, but because it has been used to hurt them badly. And now comes the real important point. There's nothing necessary about how the capitalist chooses to install the new technology, that new AI that can save half the work that used to be necessary to produce the same output. Here's an alternative that I would recommend. All the workers in this employment, in this factory, office, or store, immediately go on half time. Let's follow the logic now. They all have half a day. They're paid exactly as much as they were before for half as many hours. They produce, with this new AI, the same number of outputs. They are sold at the same price, and they generate the same revenue. The capitalist has to take and pay the workers and is left with the same profit as before. In other words, the technology would have achieved a dramatic improvement in the quality of life of a large number of employees who would have achieved leisure half the day that they're now spent working. But we don't have it that way. We instead use it to increase the profits of an already likely well-incomed capitalist and the shareholders that own the shares. We're going to introduce the, the invention to give them more profit rather than to give a large number of people a transformation of their work life. Okay, if you're agreed uh, agreeable to all that, then you and I are on the opposite side of what constitutes fairness, what constitutes a reasonable response, and what constitutes democracy. Of course, you're free to reject all of those. But what you're not free to do is pretend that the issue of AI is some abstract question of whether it will cause certain jobs to disappear. That's a distraction from what I just brought up. And the crucial question is not what it will do, but in whose, for whose benefit will it be used and at what price for what other people? Employers are 3% of the population. We use technology to enhance profits for those 3% at the expense of what the innovation could have done to the vast majority of us in terms of transforming our lives. And I think that's the issue most of the people discussing AI don't face up to. Well, that's a great point. And it also brings to mind, uh, you know, it may sound to some ears radical for you to suggest that. But it brings to mind, I, I probably mentioned it with you before, I certainly talk about it fairly often, uh, the uh, cartoon show for kids from the 1960s, The Jetsons. And The Jetsons was as mainstream a cultural phenomenon as you could expect. It was pitched to middle class kids. Uh, what a middle class family would look like in the far future. And the, the, the dad, George Jetson, worked two hours a week at Spacely Sprockets, his, his, uh, uh, some sort of machine factory. He had a two hour a week job in a cubicle and from the salary for his two hour a week job, he could support an entire family by a, a rocket car and have a robot made. And this was the presumption. In other words, in the 1960s, the presumption in popular culture, and I think in some policy circles too, is that whatever benefits might in might someday be produced by labor-saving technologies, automation, as as it was called then, uh, would be shared. You know, George Jetson had a boss. He worked at a company. There was a Mister Spacely who owned the company, a sort of cartoonish tycoon. But the idea was somehow, at one point in history, that at a minimum. 
the employer and the employee would share in the benefits of new technology. And it's taken as a given now what you describe as the discussion, which is that no, 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 the workers don't get any of it. Forget about half of it. They get zero of it. And I'm just wondering uh, whether it's deunionization or what happened in our culture between the 60s and and today that it's not even brought up as a possibility that workers' lives might be improved by this technology. Well, you know, I've answered that question before, even in discussions, I think, with you. After World War II, the shock to the uh, capitalists of this country that their system had crashed in 1929, that it took over a decade to deal with it, that a war was necessary as part of the solution. They were in the doghouse. The general feeling in America was capitalism is a very questionable system and only government interaction can rescue it. An idea which is coming back as we watch the banks fail and everything else fail with the government rescuing and everything else. But after the war, there was a rollback. The horror of the New Deal, the horror of capitalism having gotten a bad reputation. And the, the capitalists went to work, it's well known, uh, to crush the unions, to crush the socialists, to crush the communists, and to make the whole world be a celebration of capitalism, culminating in my colleague Milton Friedman telling corporations, which they loved hearing, that the most socially responsible thing they could do was to maximize their own company's profits. Total nonsense, but embraced by these people because it was the nonsense that allowed them to, to do what you just said. To say to us, you know, these inventions will eventually make life much easier. Everybody will in the end. Yeah, but meanwhile, while we're waiting for that wonderful day in the future when the invention helps us all, meanwhile, they're making sure who it helps right now, right here, and it's helping them, and it's at the expense. You know, the early founders of economics, uh, I'll pick one, David Ricardo, he worried in print that technical change that enhances the profits of the employer at the expense of the jobs of the workers, that there is no guarantee in capitalism what kind of work these people will ever get, what the cost to them will be of the interlude, which may be measured in years between getting losing the job and getting... Nobody seemed to... He, th that all was going to be taken care of, yeah? Yeah. A, there's no guarantee. B, it doesn't always happen. C, there are enormous costs while we wait. Who bears those? The answer, those who got fired. Not the people who benefited. There's no tax on the increase in profits won by a technical advance having to be used to help the people off. The closest we get is the government will provide a little bit of help if you're technologically unemployed. And there's two problems with that. The business community always fights against it, always does not want to pay the taxes it causes. So either the program is ended, which is what usually happens, or the burden of it is pushed on average people in the whole process of shifting the tax burden onto middle and low income, which is the history of the United States over at least the last century and a half. So the bottom line is, yeah, you can make wonderful, breezy assurances about how we're all going to benefit in the long run. We all plug in to the electricity we now all have. Yeah, but the human cost of that was not necessary, not built into the technology, not at all. It was a corporate decision to maximize profits that did all this damage. And to have the man who makes that decision and hurt so many people give you a breezy assurance, or to pay an economist like me to dress it up in academic language, that in the long run you benefit too, is hardly an adequate addressing of this question. There's another dimension to all of this too that I wanted to bring up with you, which is the extent to which the uh, anxiety about AI, as they call it, uh, you know, uh, again, I could go into a whole discourse about that, but I won't. It's easy for automation. The, the, the anxiety about technology uh, reflects also, it seems to me, centuries of uh, capitalism's use of uh, and manipulation of people's sense of self 
worth around their work. And it seems to me this is an aspect that hasn't been explored enough. You know, John Ruskin, the um, the 17th century, uh, 18th century um, philosopher and writer living through the early, uh, so 18th century, living through the early decades of the Industrial Revolution wrote, you can either make a tool of the creature or you can make a human being of him, but you cannot do both. He was wrestling with that, you know, early when well, people were beginning to be used as inputs basically to factories and so on and um or as extensions of machinery and uh you know of course later you know marx others writing about this issue of, of the workers place and self-perception and the notion that our self-worth comes from our work uh I think that it seems to me now what's happening with this new wave of technology because it replicates, it can replicate what a journalist does or what an attorney does or what a, uh, you know, other white collar workers can do as opposed to, let's say, a robot arm that can work on an assembly line is it may in fact be challenging a kind of self-worth that people have internalized based on the economic order that exists and not the economic order that might be. Does that make any sense to you? Absolutely. But again, I would remind everyone, this is an old procedure. You know, history changes everything sooner or later, one way or another. And the self-worth we feel about the work we do is not going to survive unaffected by all of these changes that happen around us. But again, I would argue that these are not settled questions. They're not built into the technology. They're not required by it. I think people would have a very different attitude towards artificial intelligence if we could have, excuse me, if we could have an honest conversation about how to introduce it into our system, how to integrate. Who's going to make the decisions on how's that done? For example, you could have a situation where a quarter of the workers are laid off. The other quarter have fewer hours. The other three quarters would have fewer hours because one quarter, all right, that, that would be part. And now you could do it. You, you would have a smaller group of people that have to help and you could maybe manage it. There could be some sharing of the benefits of technology now so they don't all go to profits. They go to, I mean, all of that is open unless we are have a taboo on challenging capitalism which of course we do which is why all of this is happening that's why we get all these uh, i'm trying to be polite here breezy celebrations of ai or horrible you know alarmist depictions of the wasteland of we don't need truck drivers anymore we don't need you know we don't need all these things everything can be automated this is this very gloom and doom versus celebration is of people who don't want us to face what the issue is. This is not out of our control unless we permit that. If we permit the capitalists to get the benefit, okay, then let's at least, at least be honest that the mass of the people are okay with a tiny minority deciding how to introduce a technology, doing their so, which should surprise no one, in the way that profits them, and not worrying very much about what it'll do to the rest of us. Oh, my goodness. Oh my. And then to have the do-gooders, the socialists, and, and the social democrats among them, saying, we need to have a program for the poor unemployed people made unemployed by technology. There's the mistake. What kind of socialist are you? <laughs> it's not the technology that makes the decision. It's the taboo. You don't dare question that makes the decision. So you're not helping people by wanting to have some welfare program to help the poor unemployed. You're just lightening the burden. It's the equivalent of responding to slavery by working really hard so that the master doesn't generally give more than 60 lashes with the whip, only 12. Whoa, is that the best you can do? I don't think so. 
And the, you know, I, I've pointed out a lot that the uh, certainly the last time I looked at the two major party platforms on education, and and particularly that section on re-educating workers displaced by globalization, which to me, if you take the technology glitz out of it, is a parallel yes, of automation. Absolutely, right? you know, absolutely. The pursuit of efficiency at at at, at undemocratically at the expense of working people. So, well, and I, I, um, I could show you as an economist, and maybe that's another conversation we should have, that this had nothing to do with efficiency. Moving jobs abroad was about profit. It isn't efficient right. to produce something 10,000 miles away and then have to pollute the ocean to bring that crap all the way back. They did that because they were able to pay workers in China or India or Brazil so much less that even the cost of building a new factory and even the cost of schlepping that crap all the way back to the United States to be sold still was less than what they would have had to pay an American worker to, to produce it here. That's why they moved. But instead of being honest and admitting we moved after the 1970s overseas because it was a profit maximizing strategy for us then at that time under those conditions. Instead of that, they come up with, pardon me now, but I'm going to speak a foreign language. They come up with the straight out bullshit that this is all efficient. Efficient means you counted all the costs of something and you measured them against all the benefits. There are two problems with efficiency. Number one, no one has ever done what I just said. You couldn't in a lifetime figure out all the direct and indirect consequences of the thousands of freighters that have been polluting the ocean as they bring back all that stuff from China. How many fish were killed? How many fishermen's lives were destroyed? How much illness... It would take a lifetime. No one has ever done that. And if you haven't done it, which any decent human being would admit, then don't tell me it's efficient. Because efficient means you did it, you made the measurement, and the pluses outweigh the minuses. But no one has ever done that. That's a gratuitous line of bullshit designed to make it appear that we're all the benefits of that movement of jobs along. Just like we're all the benefits of the new technology. We could be, but we never have been. And speaking of, uh, sorry, Troy, you'll have to do but speaking of bullshit, it <laughs> seems to me that both globalization and, uh, and this new technology have been hyped to the public to such an extraordinary extent. Here in this country in the 90s, it was all about how globalization was going to benefit all of us and yep. we'd all come out ahead and it would all be wonderful. Right. Nobody told us that 1,200 workers in Bangladesh would die because they were cutting corners on constructing their factories for our cheap clothing at Nine West or wherever, you know. Yeah. So there was that. And now what we have is, I, I have to read, I, I bookmarked it to you, uh, the... Uh, privatization of space flight right so we we you know we think oh it's so wonderful that now elon musk is doing it so here's a headline i saw this morning spacex that's elon musk's company spacex's starship successfully takes off before bursting into flames that's the headline yes this is the nonsense we're being peddled no this was a big win that it took off and blew up because it took off before it blew up and so we collected data about why you know come on i mean if the government had launched an exploding rocket you think that the same magazine would be celebrating that this wonderful explosion that so it, it, it you know i guess what we're having is you know a massive hype job as well as you know what you're describing really is a massive misdirection that's right uh, and a, a people, massive misspecification of what our problem is because we have a taboo at looking at how 
capitalism works. It's a system. It puts in place the employer at the top of a pyramid who has all kinds of discretionary power. He gets rewarded if he makes profits. He gets punished if he doesn't. Therefore, he does what maximizes his profits. This has nothing to do with whether he's personally a nice guy, not a nice guy, greedy, not greedy. This is all junk, these, these words. You're, it's all a substitute for facing what you're doing. Look, the parallel. You go to a therapist because you're having a, a difficulty. And one of the first things that happens with a therapist, who, if you present a difficulty, is that the therapist and you have to get through the dense thicket of BS that you have used to control and cope with life. And it was effective for you to get, get through certain difficulties in your life. But it has gone from being an effective coping mechanism to be an obstacle to what you need to do in your life. And the therapist's job is to help you recognize the misunderstandings that you've carried over from an earlier time when they weren't a misunderstanding. It's very understandable. But we're like a society that has gone through the absurdities of capitalism. I mean, the crash of 20, 2008 and nine, the crash of 2020, they're reminiscent of the crash of 29. We haven't in a century since the Great Depression. We can't prevent depressions. That's because our system has them built in and a hundred years of the best minds trying to figure out how to avoid that have failed. Okay, either you recognize that or you don't. If you don't like gross economic inequality, where have you been for the last 40 years? The statistics are unmistakable. Growing inequality, growing inequality. Our Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, my classmate, you know, she gives speeches where she's concerned about the inequality. She's been giving them year in and year out, and the inequality only gets worse. That ought to be a hint. And it's the same thing with this question of AI. And I think we ought to grow up as a nation and start talking about what the problem here is. If you don't like the way these things are being used, it's because it's the capitalist system whose rules are being followed in reaching the decisions that cause the problems we face. Well, as always, I thank you very much for your work in, in trying to shift that conversation, broaden that conversation, ground it more in real world terms and real experiences. Uh, so I guess with that, uh, I will thank you again, my guest, Richard Wolf. As always, uh, these conversations are very valuable and important, special for me personally. And as always, I thank you for coming on the program. And for me as well, I, I enjoy these conversations. Um, I really, I find it remarkable that we can get to the core of a, a number of issues in a relatively short amount of time. So whatever you do to design the flow and the organization, keep up the work. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.